Hallelujah. The glory, the blessing is on us. It's on me. Glory to God. Can you believe that there's still so many people go around and they'll actually say it, I'm cursed? Yeah. People say it, I'm cursed. And you know, the whole world is trained to curse. And don't even realize, don't even see what they're doing. The lawnmower won't start, what do, what do the majority of folks do? <laughs> they curse it. Hmm? Now, I, I know you, it, it sounds funny, but why, why do they damn it? They damn it and damn it. What does damn mean? Doomed to destruction. They curse it. Why wouldn't they say, I bless you, lawnmower. I bless you. You're a good lawnmower. You're going to serve me well as long as I have you. Why does that sound weird to most, most Christians even? Why do people think it's normal to curse stuff? Or even, you know, some people think it's cool. Think it's, it means you're tough because you curse and damn stuff. It's just ignorant. It's shooting yourself in the foot. Isn't it? If your car ain't running good, the last thing you need is to damn it and curse it. Right? You need that thing to stay together as long as you need it. So you best be a blessing and not cursing. Huh? Curse? No, not us. We're blessed and blessers. We live in the blessing. We're full of blessing, so we talk blessing. And when we're squeezed, cursing doesn't come out of us. Blessing comes out of us. Amen. Would you turn to two openings this evening? Go to Psalm 4, please. And then we'll be going to Psalm 91, Song 4, Song 91. If you didn't bring a Bible with you, hold up your hand, please, and let our ushers get one to you. Turn, find it, let your eyes rest on it, being aware that these are not my words, or they're God's words taking them very seriously, believing there's life in them, healing to all our flesh. Can you get healed while somebody's teaching the Word? Yes, yes you can. The Bible said He sent His Word and healed them. Glory to God. I know in healing school years ago, I was teaching. There was no fast piano or organ music. I wasn't waving my hands or spitting cotton. I was teaching line upon line. And uh, at the end of the uh, session, teaching say it was a morning session. There wasn't many people there. You know, nothing that would, you know, make your hair stand on end or, or toes tingle. Just, But teaching the Word in faith. And a woman came up, and she, at the end of the service, she said, Look, Brother Keith, look. I said, Okay. <laughs> she said, You don't understand. I, I didn't know her. She said, That whole side's been paralyzed. She told me how long. Showed me your notes. She, she hadn't been able to use that hand at all. Glory to God. Sitting there in the service, hearing the word, and the word. Healed her. He sent his word and healed them, the Bible says, and delivered them from their destruction. So you can receive it any time, can't you? Just faith. Jesus told people, your faith made you whole. In Psalm 4 and verse 8, Psalm 4 and 8 says, I will both, so both means two things. Both what? I lay me down and what? 
in peace, and I'm going to sleep. I'm not just going to lay down, but I'm going to lay down, I'm going to have peace, I'm going to sleep. Why? For or because you, Lord, only make me dwell in safety. The, the, today's English version says, when I lie down, I go to sleep in peace. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Glory to God. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Say that out loud, everybody. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Now, when you're watching by internet, you must say that out loud too now. And TV, you know, don't, don't, don't just sit and miss the benefit. Uh, Christianity is called the great confession. How do you get born again? You believe something in your heart and you say it with your mouth. And that's why we do, what, you know, we make these confessions. We're not just saying it to be filling up the time. We're releasing our faith. And if you believe it, the Bible says, we having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. We also believe, therefore speak. You believe something strong enough? It's going to come out your mouth. So everybody say it again. You alone, O Lord, keep me perfectly safe. Glory to God. Glory to God. We've been talking about perfect protection. Perfect protection. The Bible said in 2 Timothy 3, don't turn there, but it says in the last days there'd be perilous times. Well, we're living in later days than anybody's lived up to this point, and there are perilous times. You get accustomed to it. You get desensitized to it. But it's not okay that every time, every day you hear the news Somebody died, somebody got hurt, somebody got shot, somebody got robbed, there was murder, there was rape, there was destruction. You hear it nationally, you hear it around the world, you hear it locally. But it's not okay. It means you're living in a dangerous world. People are dying all around us. You know, people tend to try to live in a fantasy world. Like their little routine is life, and it will, it will continue forever. <laughs> How many understand what you did this week is coming to an end very soon? I don't care if you live to be 100 plus. That's nothing. It'll, it'll come. It'll go. And uh, if you and I could back off oh, about where our moon is, and see in the spirit, it would be eye-opening, all of the arrivals and departures. Millions are coming into this planet, and millions are leaving this planet daily. What is an arrival? A birth. A departure? Result of a death. And it won't be very long. You and I are going to blow this place. We're going to be out of here. And if you're a believer and you're saved, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Then, according, like the scripture said, the day of your death is better than the day of your birth. If you're a believer. Now, if you're not a believer, you don't want to leave. Till you become a believer. Because there's a bad place that unbelievers go to. But uh, all, you know, people are, are, are dying constantly by the millions. And a lot of them are dying prematurely. They're not living out their full length of days. And, and bad things are happening. It's a dangerous world we are living in. And from the other scriptures like this, we don't have the word, we don't have the basis to believe and pray and put our faith on so that this world becomes a safe place. We're told it's going to get worse. So the world is not going to get safer by and large. 
But here's the question. Even though there's a lot of danger and a lot of bad stuff going on around about you, can God keep you in the midst of a dangerous, germ-filled, huh? Crazy people, devil-filled, curse-filled, perilous, dangerous earth. Can God, in the midst of all this, can he keep you safe, even perfectly, completely safe? Is it his will? Now, here's where a lot of people depart from us. (laughs) When you get to this part, is it his will to keep you safe all the time? From now until you live your whole life out. Hmm? Well, if you believe that it is, then you believe different from millions and millions and millions of other believer Christians. Because millions of other Christians believe, well, (laughs) you you just never know. Because it could be your time. And that car could hit you at age 33. You're out of here. It could be your time and somebody pull a gun on you and blow you away at 45. It could be your time. Well, now you do understand that a lot more people believe that than what you're saying you believe tonight. We believe it is not God's will. For any of us to die prematurely from disease or so-called accident and destruction. So many of what things what people call accidents, they weren't really accidents. They're setups. We call them, people call them accidents, but it was a setup. The devil had that drunk driver at that intersection the precise moment you were coming through. That's timing, friend. Hmm? You were there at the wrong place at exactly the right time for the wrong thing to happen. It's setups. But our God is wiser and smarter than our enemy. By far, there's no comparison. And we're not ignorant of his devices. Right? And we're told to give him no place. We're to keep him waiting on an opportunity to get to us. And the years go by, and he's still looking and waiting for the opportunity to get to us. And we just get older and older. (laughs) And next thing you know, we have run our race and finished our course, and we're out of here. He says, well, if you didn't get killed or you never died from a disease... How would you die? You'd just live forever. No, uh, no, no, no. Your, your body is not you. It's just the house you live in. One, one Chaldean word, uh, and that goes back a long ways, for the body is sheaf. Sheaf, like a sheaf for a blade, a sword like a holster for a gun. What does that mean? Well, like a glove for a hand. It's something that something fits, and your body fits your spirit perfectly. Like a glove. (laughs) Now, some folk didn't like that, but hey. Your body is a reflection of you. Even less people like that. <laughs> it is. Your, your, bo- your body doesn't have any life apart from you. The expressions that people like to imagine will know, now in the spirit, I'm a very different person. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. It's you. It's the one we see expressed through this body. There ain't two different yous. Oh, no, now, Brother Keith, after the Spirit, I'm amazing. (laughs) I'm very mighty. 
and I'm nothing like what you see in this place. Yeah, and you're confused. <laughs> you're not the Holy Spirit. He's in you. He helps you. But you're not the Holy Spirit. You're you. Hmm? And we see you, the Spirit, you, expressed through your eyes, through your facial expressions, through your voice. We hear you. Hmm? We hear you. We see you. Something to think about, huh? <laughs> hmm. You are a spirit. You have a mind, soul, emotions, feelings. You live in a body. And when you slip out of this body, if you're saved, you go to be with Jesus. But you, you're supposed to run your entire race and not leave early. Because the harvest is great. And we've got too many laborers already. Huh? No. What did he say? The laborers are few, which means we need everybody we've got doing everything they can do. Hmm? And if you, through whatever reasons, check out and go home early, well, when we get to heaven, we may want to ask you about it. <laughs> and go, hey, <laughs> you know, we're glad we're all done with this, but what was the idea of leaving early and us having to do our work and yours too? So believe God and get healed. Huh? And be protected and go your whole race and finish your entire course, right? And do your job. Psalm 91. We believe it's God's perfect will for us all to be protected, don't we? But we have come to understand that it's not all up to God whether we're protected, and that's another thing that you and I are different in believing than millions of other believers. Millions of believers think and believe that it's just entirely up to God. But no, it seems very obvious to me that we have a responsibility. And if we do our part, God is always faithful to do His part. But if you don't do your part, you can miss out on some things. Psalm 91 is the great psalm of protection, isn't it? I mean, how many people quote this? And talk about the protection of God. and Even in times of, you know, uh, being uh, threatened, people will quote some of this psalm. And we'll see here that there's a Godward side to this. There is a manward side. Verse 1, begin reading and notice it. It says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, is this our part? This is something we do. He doesn't do this for us. We do it. I will say of the Lord, He is, is in italics, so you can say it like this, I will say of the Lord, Lord, You are my refuge. Lord, you are my fortress. Lord, you are my God. I trust in you. Uh, does it matter if we say it or not? Yes. Personally. Yes. Does it matter if you confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior personally or not? Yes. Hmm? Will you be just as saved if you don't do it no. as if you do it? No. Then why would we think you'd be just as protected? If you won't confess that the Lord is your protector, then if you did. No, how many have made up your mind today, tomorrow, from now on? When it crosses your mind or anything comes up relative to it, you're going to open your mouth. I believe it's important now. You're going to open your mouth and you're going to say, The Lord is my refuge. The Lord is my protector. Right? I'm trusting in Him. For what? To protect me. 
I'm trusting in him. Particularly something threatening you or try to put fear in you. Don't sit there and think about it and, oh, my Lord, what are we going to do? And talk like a lot of people that don't know any better. No, it's immediately time for you to open your mouth and say, God's our protector. What's going to happen with us? Well, like always, God's going to take care of us. Hmm? Oh, my Lord, what are we going to do? What in the world do you think is going to happen now? Don't talk like that. That does you no good. It just opens the door to fear in your life. Immediately begin to say, God will take care of us. Get a bad report. Something bad comes over in the news. Your kids look at you. What are we going to do, Daddy? What are we going to do, Mother? Don't worry, baby. God has always taken care of us. And He always will protect us. Let's stand up right now and we'll say it. I'm talking about you telling your family this. God is our refuge. God is our fortress. God is our deliverer. He will protect us. Hmm? Must speak in faith. Say it out loud. So that's our part. It goes on to say, Surely he shall deliver you. Now that's his part. You standing up saying he's my Lord, my fortress, my protector. Then God, the Bible says, Surely he will deliver you. From the snare or the trap of the fowler. Now, don't let the symbolic language cause you to miss it. He's talking about the trap of the devil. Right? God, say it out loud. Surely, Surely God, God will deliver me, will deliver me from, the from the trap of the devil. What does that mean? It means you didn't have the accident, which was actually a setup. Hmm? There was a trap the devil had set for you. But because you go around all the time talking about God's my protector, God keeps me, God keeps my babies, God keeps my kids, God keeps my family, He protects us all the time, then surely He will deliver you from the snare, the devil's trap. What else will He do? He's going to deliver you from the noisome or deadly Pestilence, I don't care how terrible a disease it is or a chemical it is, or God can protect you. Hmm? I mean, that, that snake that bit Paul on that island was apparently the deadliest thing they knew of, right? Because everybody knew that snake bites you, you swell up, you die, <laughs> right? And they were sitting there watching him. Waiting for it to happen. Well, it must not have taken long. Is this a deadly toxin that's been injected into your bloodstream? But did he swell up and fall over and die? No. No, He shook it off. And he just kept preaching to them. And they were very impressed. And they had revival in the island. Didn't they? They had a move of God. Could God do that for you? What if you breathed in something toxic? Hmm? What if you ate something toxic? Now, now, Now get this picture in your mind. Is this viper deadly? Everybody on the island knew. This snake bites you. That's it. So he's got this Deadly toxin, venom flowing in his veins. What happened? Why didn't he die? Why didn't he die? Can God neutralize substances in your body that are so toxic they could kill you on the spot? Can he neutralize them? How many remember the scripture went on to say, and if they drink any deadly thing? What? What? won't even hurt them. Now, if you believe that, it excites you. If you don't, you go, well, now I know all those scriptures are in there. But you just never know what's going to happen and what God's going to do. Well, that's unbelief. I said, that's unbelief. Let's believe what he said. Let's believe what he said. (laughs) 
I, even if a cloud of toxic dust is settled on your house and you can't even see and people are choking and dying, falling in front of your face all around you, it goes on to say a thousand may fall at my side. Ten thousand at the other. But it won't happen to me. It won't come to me. This is the psalmist saying this. He's confessing this. Are we to, to act on the Bible? Are we to do what he did? Is this something we could pattern our life? Could we talk like this? Why else would he give it to us? Hey, he didn't just give us this for us to look at this and go, isn't that amazing what faith the psalmist had? Mm, we are so impressed with the psalmist. That's just wonderful. Of course, now for us, we just never know. But this was so wonderful that he had this kind. Why even give it to you? Just to make you drool? And wish you could be the psalmist? No. The word is given to put faith in us. To show us how to think, how to believe, how to talk, what to expect. If it wasn't for us, it wouldn't be in here. Because there's all kind of wonderful things that have happened and people received and did. But it wasn't recorded for us. The things that are recorded for us, they be- the Bible said the secret thing belongs to the Lord. But those things that have been revealed, they belong to us and our children forever. Say it out loud. This belongs to me. Psalm 91 91. and the protection it speaks of belongs to me. It belongs to me. He went on to say, the Lord will cover you with his feathers. Under his wings shall you trust. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Can God put a canopy of protection around you so that in the midst of a terrible situation, you're protected? We talked about that. You shall not be afraid. Now, verse 5, who's that? Who's you? Is this is something our part again here, isn't it? Does it make a difference whether we yield to fear or not? If you're yielding to fear, you're not in faith. If you're afraid you're going to die from this, you're not going to make it through it, then you are not believing that God's protecting you and keeping you. Does that make a difference in Him having a right of what He can do for you or not? We know He's got the ability to do it for all of us. Then why doesn't it happen for everybody? Does God have the ability to keep everybody and protect everybody and heal everybody? Then why doesn't he do it? Hmm? Now millions of Christians will tell us, well, we just don't know. God picks some and he does some things and we just don't understand it and completely avoid dealing with the issue of our responsibility. That it could have anything to do with us and what we did or what we didn't do. No. How many know that if you're afraid that you're not saved and you're going to hell and you're afraid when you die you'll go to hell, that's a problem. That's a big problem. What does it mean? It means you're not in faith about your salvation. Well, I just don't know. I've tried to live a good life, but I just don't know. I, oh, I hope, but oh, man, I'm scared. I'm scared. of What if I die and go to hell? What if I die and go to hell? That's a big, big problem. Because you are saved by faith. What is faith? Faith means you are confident in what you have not seen and felt. You are counting on what Jesus did for you To be saved. And if you're counting on it and you're resting in it, you're not scared you're going to hell. Right? So does it make any difference whether you're in fear about your salvation or whether you're in faith? Well, then why wouldn't we think it'd make difference about other areas too? Whether you're in fear about your protection or whether you're in faith about it. You shall not be afraid. That's our part. We're charged. How many times in the Bible are we told not to fear? 
over and over and over and over again, you'll not be afraid for the terror by night or for the arrow that flies by day or for the pestilence. Uh, what's the, 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 the previous statement? You'll not be afraid for the terror by night. You'll not be afraid by the, for the arrow that flies by day. You'll not be afraid for the pestilence that walks in darkness. You'll not be afraid of the destruction that wastes at noonday. You will not be afraid. And that's one of the biggest challenges, isn't it? Here is this scary situation. And the first thing that will try to happen is fear will try to grip you. And here's where it's made or broken. Do you start shaking? Do you, you, begin, you yield to the fear, which is a form of believing? And begin to believe that you're not going to make it. You begin to believe, uh-oh, this is it. We're dying now. Or, 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 do you resist it? I don't care if your knees are bumping together. I don't care if the hair is standing up on the back of your neck. You can stand up in faith and say, God is my protector. He will protect us. He will keep us. Hmm? Would it make any difference? <laughs> All the difference. All the difference. The just shall live by faith. The just walk by faith. What is, what is it that overcomes the whole world and gives us the victory? Our faith. What pleases God? Our faith. Our faith. That's why we're not fear life church. <laughs> no, no, no. Faith life. I just like faith, the faith life so much better. I had some of the fear life. Did any of you have some of the fear life before? Oh, never again. I'm not going back to that. It's faith life for me from now on. Glory to God. Keep trying to get to my text for today. Seven, verse seven, a thousand shall fall at your side. 10,000 will fall at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Now stop, stop. Why? Why will it not come near you? Got to go right back to the previous verse. Why? That's verse 7. Back up to verse 6 and verse 5. Why? What are you doing while it's not happening to you? You are not afraid. He mentions that you're not afraid of the terror by night. Are we afraid of terror? No. Terrorists. No. Terror attacks. No. You're not afraid of stuff that could happen by night. You're not afraid of error that flies by day. You're not afraid of pestilence that walks in the darkness. You're not afraid of destruction that wastes at noonday. You're just not afraid. Can you be looking death in the face and not be afraid? It is gloriously possible, my friend. The devil will try to tell you, no, 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 don't kid yourself. Man, you, that thing's thrown in your face. You're going to be scared. You're going to shake. You do not have to. You can be completely delivered from the fear of death. Hmm? You're really not ready to live till you're ready to die. And the Bible said that Jesus, oh, thank God for Jesus. Jesus himself took part of flesh and blood. Hebrews says, so that he through death could destroy him that had, H-A-D, the power of death. And deliver them who through all their lifetime, because of the fear of death, they were subject to bondage. Being afraid to die makes you subject to all kinds of bondage. Did you hear this woman was bound, couldn't even leave her house? Yes. Now she's free. Amen. Now she's free. Amen. Glory to God. But see, when you, when you analyze it, why would people get so afraid? So afraid to go out and do that? Why? Because the devil said, you might catch this and what? Die. You might have a car wreck and what? die. Oh, you can't get on that plane, it might crash and you would die. Oh, you can't go over there, they might shoot you and you would. It all comes back to that. 
Oh, but when you know that you know that you know that your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And you already know the Lord tarries is coming. You're going to die. Hmm? People don't like to talk about it. Oh, Brother Keith, don't talk about that. <laughs> the Lord tarries is coming. Your cat's going to die. Your dog's going to die. Your parakeet and your goldfish. All your flowers, your trees, and you are going to die. Now you need to look it in the eye and overcome your fear of it. Because you're not fit to live till you're ready to die. Because as long as you're afraid to die, the devil will grip you. He'll mess up your life. He'll mess up your kids. Oh no, kids, y'all can't do that. You might get hurt. Oh no, you might die. Oh no, oh no, you can't do that. And you can't do this. Oh no, we better not do that. Oh, something might happen. Something might happen. You will live a crippled life. You'll live a distorted, restricted life. You'll be in bondage on every hand because you're always afraid something's going to happen. What if something happened? What if something happened? Oh, dear Lord, what if we died? Oh, like death is the worst thing it could have. No, living as a coward is far worse than dying in faith. There's a lot worse things that could happen besides dying for a believer. You've heard me say it, but let's go over it again. For the believer... What happens when you die? You step out of your body and you look at it laying there and you go, wow, that's over. <laughs> you don't turn into an angel. That'd be a demotion. Hmm? Then you go, whew, I feel good. <laughs> and you see your angel. And he goes, you ready? And you go, yeah, for what? And you get to go and see your mansion and your family and your friends and your Lord. Is that anything to be afraid of? That is nothing to be afraid of. There was a man one time that was ministering in a very, very rough place. And the guy put this 45 right between his eyes and said, I'm going to kill you right now. And the guy said, I'm ready. Are you? <laughs> no, no fear. Such freedom, friends. No fear. He said, well, I'm ready. I know what's going to happen to me. Do you know? And it shook the guy to his core because nobody he'd ever put a gun on ever said that. They fall down and go, please, please, please don't kill me. Oh, no, please, please don't kill me. I'm a preacher. I'm a man of God. Don't kill me. Don't kill me. You ain't much of a man of God. <laughs> you ain't much of a believer. Or you wouldn't be cowering in fear. Said out loud, I am not. Afraid to die. Afraid to die. You talk about freedom. When you really truly are not afraid to die, then you're not afraid of all the stuff that could cause you to die. And you just get to where you're not afraid of anything. That don't mean you need to be foolish, but you just get to where you're not afraid of anything. I know uh, years ago I was tra training, learning how to fly, and I flew with this guy that was supposed to be really good. <laughs> and the guys were, some guys at the airport were taunting him to do a certain thing, and I didn't even know what they were talking about. They said, God, do this, do this, do this. And he said, no, nah, I can't. The tower got on to me last time, and I can't. Uh, you know, they fussed at me. I can't do it. They said, oh, come on, do it. And then we, we're, we're getting ready to go, and I'm flying, and... Um, He's sitting over there, and, he, and, and they came across and said, on the unicum, be advised, these certain people that you got in trouble with, they're not here today. He said, well, give me the airplane. I didn't know I'm a student. It's a jet. He, he powers this thing up, take off, and I mean, as soon as we break ground, just boom, like that, the wing couldn't have been two feet off the ground. 
We're doing 200 miles an hour. And we come to this building, we're just going to, we're heading straight for it. I'm sitting there looking <laughs> at this building. We're, the closure rate is just, just like this. And it, it, the thought crossed my mind, you could die right now. And then the thing that blessed me so is I realized I was not afraid. I'm sitting there looking at that. And, and, and you know, just a puff of wind could cause that wing to hit. I mean, that's it. That's it. And I was not afraid. And they got so excited about not being afraid that <laughs> next thing I knew, he, he managed to pull it out and we skimmed the top of the building. And, but the rest of the day I thought, first I thought, that was really ignorant. But then, <laughs> but then and the longer I learned, the more I learned, the more ignorant I see it was. But I don't, I don't care how good you are. You can do dumb stuff, you know. Think you so, so many people think they are so much better than they really are. Some of the least experienced drivers, the youngest, least experienced, believe they are so good that they can drive 70 miles an hour on the interstate with cars all around and talk on the phone and do their hair at the same time. Hmm? Or or load the, the disc or drive with their knees and write notes and read books. Ain't nobody that good. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, he said, verse 8, only with your eyes you'll behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, your habitation, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. Now verse 9 is a repeat of verse 2. I will say of the Lord. Right? He's saying here, because you have done that. You have made, it wasn't just empty words, but you made the Lord your refuge. He's my protector, my defense. Because of that, no evil, that's God's part now, will befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. For he will give his angels charge over you or concerning you to keep you in all your ways. And they'll bear you up in their hands, lest you dash your foot against a stone. How many believe that the angels are real? And you have one and more assigned to you? Huh? Can they? Lift you up, move you, move things, move your car, hmm? move your house if it was necessary, right? Can they, are they able, and if you'll believe it and, and expect it, will they protect you? Well, if you weren't here, we went into some detail about it. and We saw some wonderful things, how powerful they are and what they can do and what they will do. But I want to go on further tonight after this introduction. You got time or not? Yes. To talk about another way God protects, how he protects. We, we've seen his canopy of power, protecting power. We, we've seen his angels. But here's, here's another thing, how he protects. Go with me to Proverbs, please. Proverbs. And the 27th chapter. If we understand more about how he protects, then we understand and are better able to cooperate with him in our protection. Amen. And knowing more what he expects of us. In Proverbs 27, Proverbs 27 and verse 12, it says, A prudent man foresees the evil. Everybody say foresees. foresees. What is one of the Holy Spirit's ministries to us? He will show us things to come. Hmm? 
And that's a bit, when it just says he will show you things to come, he didn't limit it by what things. That just covers as big as the statement. What things he could show you that were coming up. Do you believe he could reveal to you the enemy's trap and snare that was planned for you to hurt you, destroy you and yours, and spare you? He goes on to say, 27, 12, the prudent man foresees the evil and hides himself. Now, that's the, uh, the terminology you keep hearing about refuge, fortress, tower. That's what the people would do when the enemy would come and attack. They would run to these towers and these fortresses and lock them and hide in there. And he goes on to say, but the simple or the foolish, what do they do? They pass on and are punished. Now, they, they, both of them saw something that was coming up that would have hurt them. One person heeded it and avoided it. The other did not and just kept right on going and got hurt. Is this Bible? Let me read another translation. The NIV says the prudent see danger and take refuge, but the simple keep going and suffer for it. The New Living says a prudent person foresees the danger ahead and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Now, now remember, they're, both of them are seeing something. They're foreseeing, both of them are. The wise man and the simple man, the foolish man. Both of them are. You could say they're seeing the same thing. But one of them is protected because he does something about what he sees. He takes heed to what he sees and takes action based on it. The other one ignores it, overrides it, goes right on and gets hurt, suffers because of it. The English version says, sensible people will see trouble coming and avoid it. But an unthinking person will walk right into it and regret it later. How does God protect us? He has power. He has a canopy. His wings of protection. He can cover you with this power. He has angels who are mighty. And they are assigned and charged to take care of us. But also, here's a big way he protects us. Warnings. Everybody say warnings. warnings. Foresight. Yes. Sometimes people call them premonition. People call it all kind of things. But Christians should pay attention to these things and not ignore them. Now don't raise your hand. We don't want any testimonies on this right now. But if you tried... Could you think of a time when you had an inkling about something, but you didn't pay attention to it, and it cost you, or you got hurt? How many times you've heard people say, I knew I shouldn't have done that. I knew I shouldn't have gone there today. I knew I shouldn't have tried that. I knew I shouldn't have got off that tractor and left it running. Hmm? I knew I shouldn't have had my hand up under that lawnmower. Huh? I knew I shouldn't. Knew I shouldn't. Have. I'm not talking about it running. You know, I knew I shouldn't have done this. Knew I shouldn't have turned there. Knew I, should, I knew I shouldn't, but I was in a hurry. What, what do you mean you knew you shouldn't? How could you have known you shouldn't? Why would you say that? You must have had some kind of a foresight. Or you wouldn't say that. Hmm? You'd just be totally shocked and surprised when it happened. Yep. 
But when you go, oh, man, I, t- I knew that. Boy, why did you go? You were seeing something. You were picking up something. And you ignored it. You've done it. I've done it. Be hard to find somebody that hadn't done it. But if you just keep on doing it, you're slow. Right? How many times do you have to get hurt? Huh? And how serious could it be next time? And how much does it have to cost you? Before you start paying attention. Go with me, if you would, to the book of Kings. Uh, let's see, Second Kings. Second Kings. Got a lot of good things here if you've got time for it. Do you have time to be safe? <laughs> have time to miss an accident or save yourself a bunch of money? Yeah. You know, a young lady was testifying about her her mom. Her parents had a check about her going to this thing. And uh, now she didn't know why. She, She didn't know all of that stuff that they found out later. But if you walk by faith, you don't have to know why. Hmm? And sometimes it's not popular. Sometimes people are all geared up to go. And they're ready to go and they want to go. And it aggravates them if you say no. I'm not just talking about young people. I'm talking about adults. No, we're all set. We, we've spent money. We're ready. Our bags are packed. A minister friend of mine over in uh, Asia. And they had planned their vacation. Uh, where's the place where the tsunami hit? the town, I forget. But they had planned their vacation right there on that beach on those days. Them and their children, they had planned it for months. And the man, he said, I just, I have a check about going. They're believers, they're spirit filled. Well, the kid's been planning this for months and and his wife wasn't happy with him. Why? I don't know why. I just have a check. And they were safe at home when that wave washed over and killed all those people. They would have been there on those dates. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. But now let's stop. Did they have to pay attention to that? Could they have overridden it? Could they have ignored it? Very easily. And then you might have had all these people go, I just don't understand it. Those are good people, good ministers. They give their life for the gospel. Why in the world would God take them and send that wave to take them out like that? You ever heard people talk like that? I just don't understand. You know, as a man of God, why would God kill him at age 40 in that car wreck? I, I just don't understand. Why would God kill him and take him in that car crash like that? And people say, well, you just never know. I mean, God's ways are mysterious, and we just don't understand all these things. But God, I guess God needed him more up there than he did down here. And I guess God was running short on angels in the choir and and. Have you heard all this stuff? People go on and on trying to explain things they don't have a clue about. But never get over into this. Maybe they had something to do with it. Nobody wants to touch that. But that's where we ought to be talking about. Because God is faithful. And when things are messed up and don't go right, don't go looking at God. Go looking in the mirror. Right? Did we zig when we should have zagged? (laughs) Did we go when we should have stayed? Right? That's the place to look. And don't blame God. I said don't blame God. People, they think it's so mysterious and they want to go on and on. Why do bad things happen? 
to good people. There's been all kind of volumes and books written on this subject. And people got all these theories and all these goofy ideas, some of them. Why, why didn't God protect them? That is not the question. You're asking the wrong question. God is faithful. Why didn't they listen? That's the question. And we already know the answer to it. Same reason we didn't listen. But it didn't cost us that much. Right? We made it. We overcame it. But it can cost you your life. Not listening. Are you in the Second King 6? Second Kings 6? Second Kings 6. Verse 8. The king of Syria, Second Kings 6, 8, warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such place shall be my camp. And the man of God sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you pass not such a place, for there the Syrians are come down. They're waiting on you. And that's where they are. And the king of Israel sent to the place where the man of God told him, and and what? Warned him of, and what? Saved himself there, not once, uh, nor twice. Repeatedly. Now, Now, verse 10, do you have it in your eyes here? What happened? He was warned, and then what? And saved himself repeatedly. Said out loud, was warned and saved himself. Who saved him? Who saved him? He saved himself because he listened to the warning that God gave him. Well, now what if he hadn't listened? Hmm? Would God have been responsible for him perishing even after he ignored the warning? Can we reasonably expect God to protect us even though we ignore the warnings? People are trying to. They're trying to, but it's not reasonable. Heeded the warning, saved himself repeatedly. A wise man foresees it. And takes action. A foolish person just goes right on, blares through it, and gets hurt. We're not foolish. We're wise people in here. Right? Not fools. Go to Ezekiel, please. Look at the principle. Ezekiel... The third chapter. Ezekiel 3 and 17. He said, Son of man, I've made you a watchman to the house of Israel. Therefore hear the word at my mouth and do what? Do what? Give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you will surely die. And you give him not warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to to save his life. What's going to save him? This warning, him taking heed to the warning can save his life. The same wicked man will die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand if you don't warn him. Yet if you warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way. He will die in his iniquity, but you've delivered your soul. Why did he die? He ignored the warning. He he didn't listen. He didn't pay attention. And the warning was the protection God gave him. Oh, can you see this? The warning was the protection. The bridge is out. Don't keep going down the road. Stop. 
That is protection. Now, a lot of people, the only protection they think of when they think of God is the power of God picking up the car and and, and floating it across the void. But a lot of it's far more practical than people like to think. Hmm? So much of the time, God is saying, stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. And that is your protection. That is a response to you saying, God is my God. He's my protector. He's my refuge, and he always keeps me. That's an answer to your faith and your prayer. God is saying, stop, don't do this. Stop, don't go there. Don't get involved in it. Don't be a part of that. Don't do that today. Stop. And if you listen, you're protected. Hmm? If you don't, it's going to cost you. Now, go with me to the book of Matthew, please. Matthew, the second chapter. There's a lot of this in the Word, but for time's sake, we'll just touch on some of them. Matthew 2. How does God protect us? Warnings. So the question is, do we pay attention to these warnings? So everybody say, by faith, yes, I do. Matthew 2, are you there? Matthew 2 and verse 12. Jesus has been born to Mary, and uh, Joseph is there in the house. He's a little bit older now, and uh, they've come and worshiped him, and he's received the gifts. And verse 12, and what? Being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. Now these were the, uh, these rich men, these wise men. And then it went on to say, when they were departed, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. And said, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt and be there till I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Is he showing them things to come? Giving them foresight? Now this is the master. This is Jesus. How is God the Father protecting Jesus? By giving warnings to his parents. Hmm? Why would we expect something more spectacular for us? <laughs> right? He is protecting Jesus' life, isn't he? By a warning. Uh, skip down to verse. 22. Well, verse 19. When Herod was dead, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, said, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for they that, that are, are dead, which sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, notwithstanding being what? Warned Warned of God in a dream, he turned aside into the parts of Galilee. This was not a one-time occurrence, right? Repeatedly, this is how the father protected Jesus. Who's more important than Jesus? And yet this is how he protected him. Through these warnings. Warnings can come in a dream. And then they can come in a perception. Just a sense. Uh, Brother Hagen used to tell of one of his... uh, Deacons, excuse me, 
friend of his, deacon, that they got to wake up in the night and got to praying, and something was really bothering them, these pastors. And they prayed and prayed and couldn't get, you know, settled about it, so they kept praying about it. All they know is something's wrong. We should pay attention to that. Right? What do you do? Pray. How do I know what to pray about? Thank God for praying in tongues. Praying in the Holy Spirit. If you don't do that, you need to find out about it. It is for everybody. Every believer. And uh, so they, they prayed till they got easy about it and went and fell off to sleep again. And the Lord gave the pastor a dream. And he saw this member, this deacon of his, worked on an oil rig. And he saw him go out and they had a problem up in the top of one of the, the derricks. And he climbed up and he saw he hadn't been up there a few minutes. A cable broke and cut his head off. He saw that in his dream. So they, they had prayed about it. And they told him. They took these things seriously. See, a lot of people ignore this kind of stuff. They took it seriously. And so that next day, this thing came up. And sure enough, problem in the derrick. They sent him to go do it, to go fix it. He's got this dream in his mind. He said, no. <laughs> I don't want to do it. And he went ahead and told him. He said, uh, you know, my pastor had a dream and, and saw me climb up there and get my head cut off. And I'm just, I don't, I'm not want to do it. Another guy that was a Christian went to another church, different denomination that don't believe in speaking in tongues and all these things. Saved but didn't believe in it. He said, ah, I'm not superstitious. And he climbed up. Hadn't been up there a few minutes. Cable snap, cut his head off. He died. Now, both of them's Christians. God loves both of them. You know he does. Does he want to protect both of them? Yeah. One heeded the warning. The other one scoffed at it. Some of them said, well, somebody had to go. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. The whole bunch of them could have shut it down and taken this thing seriously. If they would have. Right? But see, people don't do it in this world, do they? Oh, somebody had a dream, you know, fooey. That's just a bunch of superstition, you know. People are trained. We're intelligent. We're educated people. We don't believe in all that nonsense stuff. And so people get hurt all the time, and people die prematurely. And Go to Acts, please, and you'll see a perfect scriptural example of this. Acts 27. So many things... It doesn't take long and much effort to just check it. Right? I told this before I hadn't been flying too long and, and I was in a place and I had been busy and I had a guy flying with me and, and uh, the, uh, this plane was a powerful, fast airplane and, and the crew that had been working on it were professional, they were top notch and the guy I was flying with was experienced and I was busy, and so I came in last minute, got in the door. Everything's supposed to be ready to go to start. And, I, and it came up in me. Uh, and I asked, I said, did they check the nose wheel? Because the nose wheel has a pin. You, gotta, you, you take it out to tow the airplane. But you've got to put that pin in to take off because you don't have any steering if you don't. And how many know when you're doing a 100-plus mile an hour down the runway and can't steer, that could be a problem? Yeah. Things could get... <laughs> ugly real quick and so I said did they check the pin and said oh yeah line guys checked it and we checked it and yeah so I'm putting my harness on and we're starting the engines and came up again well this ain't my first rodeo <laughs> and I've missed it too many times and should be learning by now right and I, I said uh, you check yeah we check I said well I want to check it so I shut everything down. I'm holding everybody up. I unbuckled. I got out. I, pin was not in right. Well, see, so what if we'd gone ripping down through there and run off the runway and had a bunch of fuel on there that exploded and we all burned up? Somebody else don't understand it. You know, I guess God's ready for that preacher to come on home. No. Why didn't God protect Brother Keith? No, that would, that's not the question. What's the question? The question would have been, why didn't Brother Keith listen? 
Why didn't he heed the warnings? That's, I'm convinced God loves all of his people, and anytime something like that is, is, is foreboding, I believe every time God is trying to warn us. Every time. Every, I believe every time. But the problem is people are so dull, and they're not taught to pay attention to these things. They ignore it, override it. Hmm? Can we reasonably expect to ignore God's warnings and be protected anyway? Is that reasonable? When he, that's how he protected Jesus. It was with warnings. And they heeded them. Joseph heeded them. His parents heeded them. And Herod, you, you know the story, he, he killed all the infants through the whole country trying to find him and trying to get to him. Didn't realize they're in another country. Because they followed the warning. Acts 27. Acts 27. Paul is a prisoner with a bunch of other prisoners in a ship, which was the most advanced means of world travel that existed in that day. It'd be similar to getting on the newest jet or whatever. But he is a prisoner. And the Bible said in 27 9, 27 9, when much time was spent, and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, it was the time of the year where the weather started getting bad. Paul admonished them, and he said to them, Sirs, I had a dream. Hmm? Are y'all reading? No. No. Sirs, God spoke to me. No. I had a vision. No. I heard a voice. No. No. I what? I perceive. What does that mean? What does, what does perceive mean? See, this is one of the problems is, is these things can come so naturally to you that you can ignore them and override them because people are looking for something spectacular. What's a perception? It's not hearing voices. It's not having visions. It's not a dream. What's a perception? It's a sense, right? It could not be any words at all. It's a sense. A sense of something, a perception of something. He said, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not just to the load, the cargo, and the ship, but to our lives. I, he said, he, he spoke up. This is a man that knows God, yes. right? Yes. He's there in, in, in shackles and chains, maybe, but he's a man who knows God. And he's bold enough, he speaks up. He says, now, guys, gentlemen, I perceive that if we launch and take this trip, there's going to be destruction, not just of the ship and the cargo, but our lives. We're in danger here. Well, that's a warning, isn't it? Yes. What's it time to do? It's, it's time to go to the house <laughs> huh? and plan a trip another day. No matter how much your flesh wants to go. No matter what kind of schedule you got, what kind of appointments, what kind of plans you had made, how many people are no longer with us because of get home itis? That's right. That's right. Get home itis. Had to go. Why? Had to drive all night. Had to keep going. Been up two days, but had to keep going. Why would you have to keep going? Why? Why? All the time. Something's in you going, stop, quit, pull over, get a room, don't do this, don't do this. Oh, no, but you're amazing. You're Superman. And then we have a funeral. It happens, has happened so many times, right? And people didn't know the background. They didn't know what was going on inside that person for all day and two days before. They didn't say anything to anybody, so you don't know. But I know enough about God to know he's faithful. He is faithful. And he's always warning his children. 
That's not the problem. The problem is people are not listening, not paying attention. Most, most people are not even taught that they should listen. They're not taught to pay attention to perceptions. They think that's superstition. They think it's weird. Well, I'm not a psychic, Brother Keith. I don't claim to have clairvoyant powers. People, they think people outside of God are the only ones that can pick up anything. How far we've fallen. How far the church has gotten away. We, above all people, should be perceiving you don't have to be able to quote half the Bible. You don't have to have walked with God for 50 years. The person born again yesterday can perceive something. They just have a sense in their spirit. Now, if you'll feed your spirit on the Word of God and get it strong and pray in tongues a lot, it'll be a lot stronger to you. It will. It'll be a lot more definite to you than people that live a carnal life. And don't feed their spirit. Don't pray. How many want this to be so strong in you that I mean it, it alerts you. It gets your attention. You go, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute, guys. Wait, wait. Let's look at this. I got to check. Didn't hear a voice. Didn't have a dream. Didn't see a vision. Didn't see an angel. I perceive. Somebody say, I perceive. I, perceive. I just, I have a sense about this. I I'm not, I'm, I'm not long, I'm not, you know, if everything's okay, you don't even think about it. Did you get this? If everything's fine, you don't even think about it. You just go on and do it. It doesn't even cross your mind. But when it keeps crossing your mind, keeps crossing, whoa, something, something's not right here. Something's bothering me about this. Do not override that. Don't override it. He said, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not just to the lady in the ship, but our lives. Skip down to, uh, well, this is the very next verse. What happened? Verse 11, what happened? Nevertheless, the centurion who was in charge of the prisoners Believe the master and owner of the ship more than the things that were spoken by Paul because Paul is not a, a ship owner and he is not a ship captain. He's a preacher. And this man has sailed these waters for 33 years. If you're led by experts... You're not led by the Holy Spirit. And it's true. Don't, don't try to act like you're an expert about everything because you're not. But you got the Holy Ghost, right? And you know if you got a check or not. And I don't care what the experts are saying. If you got a check, don't go. That's been a comfort to me. Because again and again, there's been areas where I, I realized how ignorant I was about this particular area. And I didn't know. And I'm dealing with people that know so much about this beyond what I know. No need me kidding myself. I don't, I'm not in their league of knowledge. But, but, but I don't just have to follow what they say. I got somebody in me who knows everything about everything. And I don't know all that they know, but I know whether I got a witness that what they're saying is right or not. I know I got a witness whether I got a check or not. And I trust him more than any expert, more than any professional. I don't care how long they've been doing it, what they know, what they think they know, what they say they know. He knows more. He really does know it all. <laughs> and he's in you. I said he's in you and he's in me and he not only knows it all, he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming down the road. He knows what the devil's got planned and is trying to do. He knows. And if we'll just heed the warnings and pay attention, we'll be spared again and again and again and again and again and again and again. And again. 
And we'll just get older and life will just keep being good and we'll be spared again and again and, and again and our kids again and again. And we just keep the devil waiting. Decade after decade. They didn't listen because he is a preacher and they are experts at sailing. And, verse 12, this haven that they were in was not commodious to winter in. It is not a nice resort. It's primitive, and who wants to stay here all winter? And that's how your flesh is, I'm telling you. Because you don't know everything, and you're thinking, man, I don't want to stay here. I'm ready to leave. I want to get out of here. Oh, but a few days, they were wishing they were back at the uncommodious place <laughs> weren't they? they were oh they were wishing they'd have stayed right they said no no let's go let's go let's go verse 13 and the south wind blew softly and that proved that that preacher ain't got a clue what he's talking about he don't know look at that what'd I tell you what'd I tell you beautiful weather perfect wind I'm gonna get a tan out here today <laughs> So they loosed, and they sailed close by Crete, but not long after there arose a tempestuous wind called Erocladon, and when the ship was caught and couldn't bear up in the wind, they let her drive, and running under a certain island, which is called Clauda, they are trying to work on that boat to keep it together, and they they undergirded it. And fearing lest they should fall into quicksands, they threw up their sails and were driven, and they were exceeding tossed with a tempest. The next day they lightened the ship. Third day they threw out with their own hands the tackling of the ship. Now you know it's bad. When you throw out the very stuff that you got to have to run the boat. <laughs> and when sun nor moon appeared in many days. Oh, man. Where were they wishing they were? Back at the uncommodious place. And no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They were in a bad way. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, you should have hearkened to me and not have loosed from Crete. And have gained this harm and loss. But now I'm going to exhort you. Be of good cheer. Even even when you miss God. There can be mercy. Especially when it wasn't your choice. Did you get this? That Paul couldn't control this. And there are situations where you can have to go through stuff. Because people in charge wouldn't listen to God. Hmm? But even in such situations, God is so merciful and gracious. And if you'll pray and seek God like Paul, what was Paul doing while everybody else was hanging on and throwing up and crying and begging and scared? He's down there praying. Saying, now, God, you know I couldn't control this bunch. And you know I got a job to do. I got to get to Caesar and preach like you told me. Right? And he pled his case and he said, I'm not just asking for my life, I'm asking for everybody on this boat. And after many days, he said, verse 23, there stood by me this night the angel of God, the God I uh, I serve. He said, fear not, Paul, you must be brought to Caesar. And lo, God has given you, why would he say it like that? He must ask for them. He has given you all them that sail with you. You know the story, the ship sank, but they all, every one of them, made it to the island and and were saved. Glory to God. But it would have been so much easier. Right? They would have never gone through all of that if when he had said, Sirs, I perceive that this is going to be a bad voyage. We're going to, we, we lose the ship and the cargo in our lives. If they'd have said, really? Well, let's just stay here. 
Let's just stay here. We can win her here. It's not the nicest place, but we can't. What if they had respected the warning? Now, now I'm going to speak something here to you. Some folks would have stayed there and griped yes. all winter. Yes. Hmm? Yes. And then come spring that it said, see there, you know, we could have went. Right. That's right. Nothing happened. Because they wouldn't know what the weather was doing way over there. It never happened. It ne- exactly. <laughs> Nothing happened. Exactly. Shout. Hallelujah. Well, nothing happened. They all talked about it. I didn't see nothing happen. Nothing, nothing. We stayed and nothing happened. Exactly. Be glad. Glory How many know boredom sitting on the island in an uncomfortable place can be wonderful <laughs> compared to hanging on to a mast, puking your insides out, <laughs> hadn't seen anything in days, thinking you're going to drown just any minute. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, give me the uncommodious island. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Go to Hebrews. I think we can close with this. God has protective power. He has a canopy he can put over you. He has angels that are assigned to us. People like to think more about that. That seems more spectacular. And, but don't forget, now I believe this is one of the main ways and every day in, day out ways he warns us, he protects us is by these warnings, I'm trying to say. Warnings. Say it out loud, I'm led by the Spirit. I'm led by the Spirit. And, I heed and I heed the direction of the Spirit. The direction of the Spirit. By, the God, by the grace of God, I'll pay attention, pay attention. And, not ignore, and not ignore and not override. And not override. Now we're all learning in these areas. Yes. Hmm? Yes, we are. And you could make a mistake. Yes. But it's better to make a mistake, check, taking a moment and checking out something, hmm? yeah. like that airplane thing I talked about. Yeah. Which is it better? Yeah. To make everybody wait a minute yeah. and check yeah. or not check? check? How long did it take? How long did it take me to get out of there and walk around the front and look? Yeah, but we've been waiting and and we've been waiting and we're running late. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, would you rather I push it too hard trying to get back for a service and you not see me again? Or me miss a service and be with you for another 40 years? How about you and your family? And your friends. Again and again, you, you think you got to be somewhere? You don't. You don't. In fact, they may not miss you as much as you thought they would. <laughs> so many times, this wasn't a deal at all. But you made it this huge deal. Oh, we got to be there. We got to be there. We got to be there. Do you? Do you? That's, they're trying to keep their schedule, aren't they? Aren't they? Yeah, we've got to get this load to dock a certain time. We've got to do this, got to do that. That's one. I am so thankful that we can fly ourselves now. It gives us control. We're not trying to keep a schedule. We have control. We can say, nope, we don't want to go right now. I was flying with Brother Kenneth one time. Copeland, first when I first started, and we got in a thunderstorm, and actually the controllers turned us into the thunderstorm, Ooh. and man, it's shaking us like a rag doll, stuff's flying around the cockpit, I'm holding on, <laughs> of course I'm green, you know, I don't know, and I looked at him, I said, Brother Kenneth is flying, and I said, what, what do you do? 
in a situation like this. <laughs> He's, he got his hands full. He said, boy, you stay in the bed. You stay in the bed. What does that mean? <laughs> you don't have to go. Right? And that's one reason God gives us equipment so we can have the choice and have some control. You know, what if, what if Paul had owned this boat? What if this was his ship? Hmm? He could have said, no, I got a check. Just unload. We stay in here. It's my ship. It's my call. Hmm? Thank God for having your own. And God's given you your own. And us our own. Why? More control. Why is that good? Because when we have control, God has control. Because we're going to listen to Him. Other people don't always listen to Him. Even if we made a mistake, we're trying to. Right? A lot of folk never even ask. They don't check. They don't pray. They don't care. They'd scoff and mock. You said you had a leading. Like they did. No, you don't have to be there. Are you at Hebrews? Yeah. Hebrews 11, the great faith chapter. I want to remind you of why and how you and I are in this building tonight and why we exist and how come we're alive. Hmm? You ready? Yes. Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Not just hard. For he that comes to God must, not optional, must believe that he is. How many does? You, you believe God exists? You believe he's real? And, somebody say and. and. See, a lot of people stop there. That's all they believe. That's not enough. If you're going to please God, you must go further. And believe what? He that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. What does that mean? That means you're going to get a response. Yes. Yes. Oh, come on now. It means God is a good God. You call out, He answers. You ask Him to do it, He will. Yes. You count on Him to protect you, He will. Yes. You seek Him, you serve Him, He will keep you. He will bless you. He will reward you. He will help you. Glory. Well, we just never know what's going No, you've got to believe that He will. Yes. Yes. Not just that He is God and He can. Yes. Thank you, Lord. What is it believing He's a rewarder? You believe He will do something. In response to you. Can you see where so many folk are missing it? Though they believe in God. They believe he is. They believe he's real. They believe he's all powerful. They believe he can do anything. Will he reward you? Will he bless you? Well I don't know. I hope so. It's up to him. They're not believing this are they? No. So are they pleasing God? No. no. It's impossible to please him. Without believing this. Now keep reading. Very next verse. What did it say? By faith. Noah, what's the next word? What's the next word? Huh? You know why you're here tonight? Huh? <laughs> what if Noah had said, Rain? What's that? A ship? Out here? That big of a ship. Never heard of anything like that as long as people have been on the planet. What if he had ignored the warning? Or just put it off and put it off and put it off. And go, well, I don't know what that is. I, that's, a, that's a wild thing. Build a ship out here. Yeah. Multiple stories. Huge. Lord, you know how long it's going to take me to build that? Lord, you know how much money that's going to cost? It's going to take me and my family and everybody I can hire night and day for the next 
How many years? It would have been a lot easier to ignore the warning. Been a lot more convenient. This messed with his life. Didn't it? This changed his plans. Whatever he did have planned, it's out the window now. Because what's on, the, what's on the, the docket tomorrow? Boat building. What's on the docket next week? Boat building. What's for next year? Boat building. Boat building. Why did he do it? Why did he do it? He was warned. Come on, somebody say it out loud. He was what? He was warned of God about what? Things not seen as yet. And he moved. Everybody say, he moved. moved. See, the, the, the foolish man won't pay attention. He'll ignore it. But the wise man will respond. He moved. Glory to God. He prepared. Somebody say, prepared. He got ready. In response to the warning. How did God the Father protect Jesus? repeatedly with warnings how did God save the whole human race with a warning how's he going to save you <laughs> and me and your kids warnings warning pay attention to the warnings take heed to it could be a dream but many times it's just like what Paul got a perception just a perception, just a sense. If you, if you miss it, if you're too cautious on something, you go, well, I thought I had a check on that, but it turned out nothing to it. It's better to do that, yeah. right, than to blare through something and get destroyed and everybody wonder, what, you know, what happened? No, we're in the learning process. All of us are. Some are better, you know, better at listening than others. But if you'll just purpose in your heart, I am going to listen. And I'm going I'm to check and I'm going to pay attention. Then God's got something to work with. Right? And what happened to the, the king that the man of God warned? Saved himself again and again. Repeatedly. Stand on your feet if you would. Glory to God. I'm excited in my spirit. I have a sense in my spirit. As we're talking about this, I just have the sense in my spirit. Person after person, person after person, situation after situation in the future will be spared. Amen. Things that the enemy had planned to hurt, to damage, to rob, to steal, to destroy, to kill, to take out, won't happen won't happen because maybe maybe years ago or maybe even last week you wouldn't have paid as close of attention to it but God's teaching you you're getting a hold of it and you're going to grow in this and by the time you get to that thing you will be sharper and you'll be paying attention and when it comes up you will not just ignore it and you will be saved I believe it I, I see it glory to God Say it out loud. Let's, let's pray this prayer. Say, Father God, Father God I, believe in you. I believe in you. You are my God. You are my God. You're my fortress. You're my, fortress. You're my, keeper. You're my keeper. You're my protector. You're my protector. I, trust I trust in you. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your power. Under, your Under your wings. Under your canopy. Under your canopy. I'm, safe. I'm safe. Thank you that you've charged your angels to keep me. I believe they will. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you that he shows me things to come. Thank you for warning me of the devil's traps and ploys and plans Thank you, Thank you for warning me, for warning me. And, protecting me and protecting me and all mine, and all mine. Help, me help me to be more aware, be more aware. And, to and to grow in sensitivity and understanding of your dealings, your ways, 
your leadings and I purpose to not be foolish, to not ignore, to not override, but to take heed, take heed and respond and move accordingly to the warnings of the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Lift your hands. Let's praise God. Let's give Him thanks. Lord, thank you for sparing us and protecting us. How wonderful you are. How faithful you are. How good you are. Glory to God. Let's thank Him for protecting us in the future. Let's thank Him in advance for what we believe. Lord, thank you. I'm thanking you for those things I'm perceiving. Thank you. Thank you for protecting us and sparing us and our children and our our family and friends and our stuff again and again and again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, let's praise him a little bit more. Oh, Lord, we thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. What what are you? Go to G, please. Oh, I yield myself to the whole. Everybody say To the ocean of God Oh, I say I yield myself Yes, I do To the Holy Spirit Oh, I let Him be my guide Everybody say I yield myself I yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Oh, I yield myself to the ocean of God. Oh, I yield myself, yield myself to the Holy Spirit. Oh, I let. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Just thank him real good. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Thank you. We will listen. We will hear. And we will obey every time. We won't override. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Hallelujah. It's good tonight, wasn't it? growing us up, teaching us more and more every time. Amen. Amen. Everybody coming back Sunday morning? It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Get to hear Miss Phyllis talk Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Be sure and be back. Praying for Brother Keith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, We're going to be dismissed as the choir sings. But if you've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, if you've never confessed Him and made Him your Savior, as, the, as they're singing and everybody's leaving, you come forward. We're going to have people standing along the front to, to greet with you, to pray with you. Don't leave here. There's no reason for you to leave here uncertain of where, you're, where you'd go if you left here tonight. Don't, no reason at all. There will be people standing in front to pray with you. So as, it, as people are leaving, you come down front. Amen? All right. They're going to sing. We'll be dismissed. See you all Sunday morning.